Thank you so much for joining us on The Dwelling Show. I'm your host, Ola Dantes. I've got an amazing, amazing guest with us today. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Ola, I am fantastic. How are you, my friend? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, yeah thanks so, for having me on your show. No, my pleasure. I cannot wait to, to jump into this. Um, so for those who don't obviously know you and know your story, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you've been doing, and kind of what you've been up to lately? Yeah, so Dave Dubow, I'm a real estate entrepreneur based in beautiful British Columbia, Canada, uh, born and raised in British Columbia. However, I lived overseas for 13, almost 14 years. I spent 10 years living in and working in San Jose, Costa Rica, where I had a language training company. I dabbled a little bit with real estate investing there, but really jumped in when my uh, my wife and I decided to moved back to Canada from Costa Rica and had I had to start all over again from scratch. That was way back in 2003. So came back to Canada, but I was living in a brand new city, no contacts. I had been gone so long, I didn't have very good credit. I didn't have bad credit, I had zero credit. I had not been able to sell my business to Costa Rica, so I didn't have a lot of cash. So I was starting all over again from scratch. And that's when I saw one of those infamous late night infomercials you too can get rich in real estate with little or no money now. <laughs> Remember those, Ola? Yeah, and no work. No work whatsoever. <laughs> well, no, they didn't They didn't tell me there'd be no work. I knew there was going to be work, but I sent away for that thing and uh, put it to work. I did 18 deals in 18 months. That was kind of my first kick of the can with, with getting started. I took some time off of real estate investing for about six years. I was the marketing guy for an up-and-coming real estate guru up here, kind of the Canadian version of Robert Kiyosaki kind of thing. And I helped him grow his companies from two employees to 128 employees and seven branch offices and about $200 million a year in revenues uh, during the time that we were working together. And then I, I got back into active real estate investing in about 2010, give or take. And that's when I discovered how poor I was at raising capital because I, I self-financed my first couple of deals, Ola, and then I ran out of cash, ran out of credit. You ever been in that situation? Kind of sucks because that's when the good deals seem to come your way. And I remember it vividly. I remember this really good deal landed in my lap. At that time, I was doing a, a strategy called tenant first rent to own. And these perfect tenant buyers came in. We went, we found them a house. We got it under contract. Got everything tied up, ready to go. I crunched the numbers. I was going to be able to pay my investors a very healthy return. I was going to be able to make a nice little $40,000 profit in about two years on this little single family home deal. The only thing I was missing was the capital. I needed $85,000 to close on this property. And I'd always heard, hey, you know what? If you find a really good deal, Ola, the money will find you. Have you ever heard that expression? Yeah. So I heard that too, but I knew I was going to have to do something. So I, I remember somebody saying, hey, you know what? If you want to raise money, pick up the phone and start dialing for dollars. I didn't really want to do that, but you know, there were movies out there like The Wolf of Wall Street and stuff like that. Made it look kind of fun. So I tried it. Dialed, rejected, 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 rejected. All sorts of rejection. My fragile little ego could not handle that much rejection, Ola. Reminded, too much, reminded me too much of dating back in high school. <laughs> Anyhow, I said, enough of that. So uh, I quit dialing for dollars. And then I tried networking and schmoozing and turning every conversation into a real estate conversation and practicing my 30-second elevator pitch and all this stuff I was told you're supposed to do. And again, I wasn't able to raise any money from that because you know, 2020 hindsight, the desperation just kind of oozed out of me. And now I was getting really desperate because only like I had to get an extension on the subject removals on this property. And that's when I came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea. I said, I, I deluded myself into thinking, hey, you know what? If just enough people see this opportunity, it's so good, it's going to sell itself. So I put, I did one smart thing as I came up with a a group of a couple of hundred people who already knew me. And I thought, okay, well, if I just get the word out to all these people, somebody's going to jump on this deal. So I put together a one page PDF and I emailed that out to all 200 people. Did that like on a Wednesday night, 
had dinner, went to bed, all that kind of stuff. Next morning, got up and I was excited because I got a bunch of responses. But basically, the responses said, hey, Dave, dude, I haven't heard from you in forever. And here you are hitting me up for money for a deal. Take a hike. So Ola, the sad story ended with me having to collapse that deal, having to refund my tenant buyer their twelve dollars or $15,000 deposit they'd pay me, uh, having to uh, taking off them, taking off the seller, the realtor, the mortgage broker, everybody. And I live in a fairly small town, so I had some major egg on my face. But here was the worst thing. It turns out that I actually, because I was so clumsy, I actually turned off a lot of really good prospective investors just because I was so clumsy about it. So after, after the smoke settled, after the dust settled, I thought to myself, hey, dummy, what are you doing? This, this is really, really stupid. You know a few things about marketing. Why don't you apply that for raising capital instead of desperately chasing after investors when you've got a deal on the go? Why don't you get investors coming to you? Why don't you raise the capital first and then go look for the deal? So that's what I did, Ola. And I came up with this, what I call the five-step money partner formula. Transformed me and my raising capital, helped me raise millions of dollars over the years for deals. But more importantly, it's helped a lot of other, what I call mom and pop real estate investors, get started with raising capital. Wow. Thank you so much for that. That's really insightful. Um, so, I, you know, I wrote a bunch of stuff down and I'm always trying to, you know, put myself in the shoes of those listening, right? Um, you know, what are they trying to learn? So before we actually get into the, you know, the, the crunks of raising capital and what do you actually sure. um, do to do that? But I, I wanted to kind of touch back on your journey a little bit. So you mentioned 18 deals in 18 months. Yeah. Uh, if I'm listening to this, most likely I want to do deals. Uh, you know, I'm not a rich, you know, multimillionaire already. I probably want to do 18 deals in 18 months. How did you do that? And what, what kind of deals were those? Well, it sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> yep, it does. It sounds impressive. And it, some of it was impressive. These were all creative, no money, low money down kind of deals. At that particular time in 2003 in the area I was in, it was a buyer's market. All right. So the the economy, the, the housing market wasn't that great. There were a lot of people that were in kind of desperate situations with their property. So there were a lot of motivated sellers out there at that time, Ola. So I was able to do creative, low money, no money down type deals. So what kind of things did I do? I did things like sandwich lease deals. So rent owned deals. I did things like options. I did things like uh, buying the property for a dollar and taking it over as with the underlying financing still in place. I did these kind of things. And some of them were with really good single family homes. Some of them were with absolute pieces of crap, mobile homes and mobile home parks. So, I mean, you know, I think my most profitable deal in that time frame might've made me a $40,000 profit. Uh, but a lot of them were like two to five to $10,000 type deals. So it sounds really good, 18 of those in 18 months, but basically it was a way to make a living. It was a very active form of real estate investing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I want to touch on um, your, your, your friend or partner that you were helping to build this business, um, the, yeah. kind of the guru. I've got so many questions about gurus. Um, I don't know if they're going to be um, almost even relevant to this, but I've got one to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you said you kind of helped him scale from like two to 20 employees. 200 million in revenue. I'm just kind of curious, is this just from the, just like seminars and training or it was this guru also, did they actually own real estate? Oh yeah, no, the largest part of the, the money that, they, that his company made was from offering real estate deals. So syndicating properties, syndicating uh, those kind of things, um, offering investment opportunities, that sort of thing. There was a lot of, uh, training involved in that and, and part of that yeah the education side of the business is what fueled the back end side of the business as well no that's good to know okay so let's kind of jump in a little bit yeah um i i want i want to talk about kind of the raising capital aspect but i want you to tell us a story of 
um, maybe your first deal that you raised um, money for, um, just kind of give us the backstory. And I think this is good for somebody might be listening, thinking, I'm scared of raising money. I don't know what to tell my family and friends. Like, you know, kind of give us that story of, or maybe when you raise the most money, like how, what does that look like? How did you have those conversations? Well, like the, the, the story of when I first tried to raise capital was the one I just told you where I failed miserably. After that, <laughs> the proper did, way, the proper way. Yeah, the proper way is this. The, the one thing I did right, Ola, was I came up with that, that group of a couple of hundred people that I already had a pre-existing relationship with. Because a big mistake people make when they start raising capital is they think everybody and anybody could be a good investor for me. Anybody with a checkbook that doesn't bounce could be an investor. And that's a big mistake for two reasons. Number one, common sense, right? So if you're trying to raise capital from somebody, if you want to raise 50 or $100,000 or whatever it is, that person's going to need to know you, like you, and trust you with their money. If you're going out to strangers, they don't know you, they don't like you, they certainly do not trust you with their money. So you're starting from scratch. That's a very difficult thing to get going. Second challenge is legalities. And where are you based, Ola? Houston, Texas. Yeah, so you got this little thing called the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? <laughs> We've got the same thing in Canada. All of the Western world has their own version of that. And basically... I don't claim to be an expert, but basically this is my understanding. It's illegal for you and I and other mom and pop real estate investors to raise capital from the general public, from strangers, unless we're licensed to do so. We've got a, we're like a, a stock broker, a mortgage broker, a financial planner, somebody like that. Or if we've got certain exemptions with the SEC or we've got an offering memorandum or we've set things up with certain corporate structures and all of this tends to be very expensive, cumbersome, and beyond the scope of what we want to do when we're first starting with, with raising capital, right? So, so that's challenge number one. So that's why we really need to focus because there's, there's, there's an area there where we can play, and that is with friends, family members, close uh, work and business associates. So that's, that's where we want to start, number one, because that's a logical place to start. Who else is going to invest with you when you're first getting started and you don't have much of a track record working with investors. And second of all, that's the low hanging financial fruit. In fact, when we're working with clients, we find that, that on average, our clients have access to somewhere between one and $2 million worth of capital just from their sphere of influence. It's just a matter of figuring out how do we access that? And that's what this, that's what this process is all about. So the first step to answer your question, let's create that list of a couple of hundred people but let's not do what dumb, dumb Dave did. Let's, let's get started on the right foot. Let's break the ice and reconnect with these folks on more of a personal level first before we start pitching deals. Does that make sense, Ola? So when we're working with clients, we walk them through a very simple little three-step email warm-up campaign to break the ice and to set the stage and get everything prepped up for the rest of the marketing that'll go out after that. Okay, that makes sense. All right, yeah. what's the next thing? What do we do next? Well, the next step is after we've got the list and after we've broken the ice, we want to be prepared in case somebody puts up their hand and says, hey, Ola, what's this cool real estate thing you're doing? So we aren't caught like the deers in the headlight, right? So we've got something to show them. So what we do is we recommend that you put together a uh, slide deck presentation, like a PowerPoint, or a keynote presentation, keep it simple, keep it easy to understand. Always remember that your prospective investor is probably not what I like to call us a real estate weirdo like we are, like your followers are, right? And I say that with love and respect because we are, right? They're probably a normal human being who doesn't want to learn every single thing that we know about real estate. So we need to keep it kind of, I wouldn't say superficial, but we need to keep it reader's digest level. And Reader's Digest was a magazine written for grown-ups. However, it was written at a 13-year-old comprehension level. So that's what we want to do with our presentation. Not that our investors are dumb. It's just that they don't want too much data. That's a big mistake I see people making, just over-educating people. So that's step number two. Let's make sure we get ready to go with a good investor presentation. The next step is now it's time to kick things into gear with marketing. 
what I call constant, consistent, edutaining communication. So again, remembering that our prospective investors are not super into real estate, we want to keep it a little bit, a little bit educational and hopefully a little bit entertaining at the same time. So this all starts with having a really good investor-focused website. That's going to become your online communication hub. Everything comes from it. Everything encourages people to come back to it to consume your information, right? And then the next part is let's make sure that we got a drip, drip, drip campaign going out every single week. Something's coming out from you, edutaining communication to your list of prospective investors. Each one of those with a very clear call to action. Hey, if you'd like to find out more about what I'm up to and how real estate can be a big benefit for you, go ahead, click on the button, book a call, let's have a conversation and see how it works. Does that make sense? So you're always telling people exactly what you want them to do. You're, you're creating curiosity. You're not trying to sell your deal. You're just trying to sell people on the concept of real estate and get them to book a conversation. Then that's where you're going to use your presentation to show them what you've got, edu educate them about it, and allow them to make an educated decision uh, about whether they want to invest with you. The beautiful thing is you can do that without being salesy, without being high pressure, without being manipulative. It's just about having a conversation. Does that make sense, Ola? It definitely makes sense. Um, I've got a, I've got a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I struggle with this personally because I feel like I'm a digital minimalist. So when I sign up for some people's email list and they kind of bombard me every week, it's kind of like, you know, top 10 reason to invest in. And I'm like, oh, unsubscribe too much. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like every week is too much because usually most people just don't have the time to read the blog or whatever. But then some people argue it's not about the content, right, of that email. It's just that kind of touch point, like just seeing your, your brand name or your name every week just kind of makes them think of you, I guess. So what are your thoughts on that? I would rather get like one email per month, if any. Yeah, fair enough, Ola. And you know what? You can do whatever you like. But what we need to remember is that we are not our investors. We are not our investors. In fact, if you look at a lot of the most successful marketers out there, they don't communicate once a week. They commun communicate once a day with the people on their list. Now, I think that might be a little bit too much. However, you know, I probably communicate with my list for, yeah, almost once a day, four or five times a week for crying out loud. Um, so again, here's, here's what's gonna happen. If everything you send out is crap, then yes, people are gonna get annoyed and they're going to unsubscribe and they're not gonna open up your emails. If you're sending out edutaining communication, a little bit educational, a little bit entertaining, are they going to open it all? No, they're going to take a look at the subject line. If it creates, if it piques their curiosity, they'll click it, they'll open it. If not, they won't. If they don't want to get your stuff, they'll unsubscribe. No big deal, right? But here's the thing. Uh, we found that the, the actual unsubscribe rate for our clients is quite low. It's actually quite low uh, because again, you're, you're not emailing a bunch of strangers. You're emailing people that you have a pre-existing relationship with. And we keep it short and sweet. Like you don't want to overwhelm people with too much information. That's why we try to keep it edutaining. Fascinating. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So we, we gather a couple of hundred of our friends and family, keep them on this nice little warm, you know, drip campaign going. Exactly. Um, get them to, you know, do something, right? Call to yeah. action. To, to do do self-identify, to book a call, to opt in for something, to sign up for a webinar, whatever, whatever that looks like. Yep. So I'm following the five-step process. So are we on step three? That was step three. Step number four is now to be seen as a credible real estate expert in the eyes of your prospective investors. So here's the good news, folks. Number one, you don't need to have a ton of deals under your belt. If you have a bunch of experience, that's great. That's helpful. But all you really need is one successful deal under your belt to be seen as an expert and authority in the eyes of most of the people on your list. Because the statistic I've heard, Ola, is that 95% of the general population has never invested in a revenue property. Their own house does not count as a revenue property. I'm talking about an investment property. So if you've even got one successful deal under your belt, 
chances are you're already ahead, way ahead of 95% of the non-real estate people that you know. So how do we create this credibility and this expertise and this authority? Well, the good news is you don't need to become the next Robert Kiyosaki and sell a billion books. All you need to do is keep it up. The marketing goes a long way there. The sharp looking website goes a long way there. A good presentation goes a long way, but also a few simple things you can do. When you're meeting with somebody and you're talking with them about investing with you, I highly recommend that you dress up a bit, that you dress business casual. It's going to give them respect. It's going to get you respect back from them. I'm also going to recommend that you can speak knowledgeably in a simple manner about your primary real estate investing strategy and the main market that you're investing in. So you can explain that again at a high level, at a, at a Reader's Digest level. Next thing I recommend, invest a few bucks and get some professional photographs taken, headshots, right? Then you can use those on your website. You can use those in your presentation. Get professional business cards done up, not the cheap do-it-yourself print-at-home kind, but actually invest a few bucks in some really sharp business cards that leave an impression. These are things that you do, simple things that you can do to really be seen as an authority. And then that marketing really comes in, like you mentioned before, Ola, just the fact that they're seeing you on a regular basis, constant and consistent, right? Week after week after week. The other thing that does is subliminally, they see you as being reliable. They see you as being consistent. They see you as being an expert. And what kind of a person would they like to invest with? They'd like to invest with somebody who's reliable, consistent, and an expert. Does that make sense? So it all kind of ties together. It absolutely does. I like this a lot. Yeah. So that's step number four of smart things you can do. Hey, you know what? Get interviewed by smart guys like Ola on their, on their podcast. That's a great thing to do. Uh, take part in your local real estate investment association, your real estate club, meetup, whatever it is. Find a group of local real estate investors and be proactive. Volunteer to be on, the, on one of the directors of the club. Introduce people at club meetings. Speak if you're comfortable doing that. Mix and mingle. Get, be, be in front of other people who are around real estate. Because here's one of the cool things about clubs. I found, I don't know if you found this, Ola, it's about, it's about the 75-25% rule. 75% of people that go to real estate clubs are just getting into real estate investing, just thinking about it, kind of sitting on the sidelines. 25% are active. If you're one of the active ones, chances are you can get some investors from, from just the other people in the club that want to get involved, but they don't actually want to do it themselves. Yeah, it's funny you said that. I'm actually, after this interview, I'm, I'm going to uh, my meetup, um, Houston Multifamily Association. So nice. yeah, you're, you're absolutely um, spot on on that. Yeah. All right. So that's step number four, be seen as an authority. It's not as tough as it seems. And then step number five is once you've got even one or two investors on board, Ola, you can start the snowball effect. So if you're doing a good job for your investors, guess what? It's really easy to get testimonials from them that you can use in your marketing. It's also, if you know what you're doing, pretty easy to get warm introductions to their sphere of influence, their friends and their family members, because they tend to know and hang out with other people with money. So once you got one or two investors on board, it's easier to get more of them and start that snowball effect with testimonials and referrals. So that, in a nutshell, very quickly, is the five-step money partner formula. Ola. Thank you so much, Dave. Love it. Um, I wish we can we can keep going on and on, but we're actually definitely dwelling into the quick rounds right now. Sure. It's going to be quick questions, quick answers. You ready, sir? I hope so, my friend. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. First question. What makes you, Dave, unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl? Well, it's probably because I'm just so darn good looking and modest, Ola. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first. I like that. <laughs> Second question. Um, what was the last book that you read? And what was the one thing you picked up from that book? Okay, well, I love that question. Here's, I don't know, this is the last book I read, but this is the favorite book I've read lately. Dan Sullivan, Who Not How. You probably had a bunch of people talking about this one. The title says it all. Well, it's all about once you know what you want to do, it's not so much about how to do it, as who can you bring on board to do it for you 
they can probably do it better than you can. So for the longest part of my life, I always thought, you know what? I got to be that rugged individualist. I got to figure it out. I got to learn it. And then I got to do it myself. That's just dumb, right? Now, unfortunately, I got this many gray hairs and I'm missing so much hair, but I wish I had to figure this out a long time ago. It's way better to know what you want to accomplish, get the gist of it. And then if there's somebody else who's really good at doing that already, get them to work with you, get them to do it for you, whatever it is, hire them, outsource it, right? Focus on what you're good at. Fascinating. Final question. What do you do for fun? Oh my goodness. I love to travel for fun. My, my lovely wife, Miss Max and, and myself, we love traveling. That's been kind of on the back burner a little bit since the whole pandemic hit, but that's a big thing for us. So now we're primed up, ready to go. We're hitting Mexico in December. We're hitting Disneyland in March or something like that. We're hitting, nice. oh yeah, before that, we're hitting the Balkans in April. We're going to go to New York next September. Uh, we got a whole bunch of travel, pent up travel books. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Dave, um, really, really enjoyed this interview. If there's anybody listening thinking, I really like what Dave is saying. I want to get connected to Dave. Where can people reach out, you know, get to learn more about you? Excellent. Well, thanks, Ola. They can go to moneypartnerformula.com. Again, moneypartnerformula.com. Three things you can do there. Number one, you can grab a free copy of my book, Money Partner Formula, in exchange for your name and your email address. Number two, you can find out about what we do with our, our uh, virtual workshops where we take a deep dive into this whole five-step process. And number three, if you'd like to book a chat, you can do that as well. We can talk about how we can help you actually implement all of that. So again, moneypartnerformula.com. Easy to remember. Thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate your time today. I learned a bunch of new things myself, so I really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Ola. Take care.